it started out actually as a um, we wanted to do a documentary about Borderland, and that was really the the original idea. And when we started uh, doing a little research, it was like, wow, who is this Blanche Ames? This pretty amazing woman. And um, as we uh, turned over each rock, uh, it was just just something more to be said about her, uh, all her talents. You know, at first, you know, she was an artist and an inventor, which uh, which I, I knew a little bit about, but I didn't really know about her work in the suffrage movement. And um, even more importantly, as it progressed, uh, her work uh, with women's rights, particularly with health issues and and such, and how that a lot of that was hidden, and uh, so it just uh, it just kind of uh, you know turned out to be really a story about a pretty amazing woman. And Kate was that the was that uh, that is I mean I'm switching gears here. It's funny how when we were working on this, Kevin, we were thinking, oh, we've got this window where this is going to be relevant. You know, the hundredth anniversary of the ratification of the 19th Amendment. And now listening to it again tonight, I'm like, oh, it seems very topical <laughs> today. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> it's like these, I think that's her point, these battles. It's not like you can ever say, okay, we got that done. Right. When it comes to women's rights, it's just a, you know, it's just a constant battle. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. All right, what about the rest of you? Who who else has questions? This is not a quiet group, I'll tell you, Kevin and Kate. Oh, they good. are very vocal and they good. ask some incredible questions. Um, Catherine, I know you're about to uh, leave in a couple of minutes. Um, do you have any questions or anything you want to jump in and ask? You have to unmute yourself. There you go. Yes, let's see how I, I sound. Um, uh, Kate and Kevin, from all you learned about Blanche, uh, what was the most surprising? What do you think, Kevin? Well, I think her work as uh, president of the Birth Control League of Massachusetts, uh, for me, was striking in how, uh, how it was not out there, how it was never mentioned, there was very, very little uh, paperwork to be found until we really started digging. Um, I found a lot of that papers at the Schlesinger Library. And, um, and also uh, we saw this, you can see a very brief uh, picture in it of a, of a, a, a naked woman on a, on a cross, almost like a crucifix. And when, when we were going through papers and I first came on that illustration, I could tell like there's something, uh, something really, uh, really deep in this woman's soul about her desire to uh, to work in that direction, and um, so yeah, I, I think that's what surprised me. And what surprised me most about it was she started that work in 1916 before um, the actual uh, passage of the 19th Amendment. So while she was working on suffrage, she was seen beyond that, and and. Uh, thinking about other issues that were, that were very important. I think one of the things that surprised and impressed me so much about Blanche is this is a woman who, as we would say today, did not work outside the home. All of this work she did was unpaid. She was a volunteer. And yet, as a volunteer, she never retired. <laughs> and she kept pivoting to these concerns and passions and here she was a socialite she could have just checked out and enjoyed that beautiful house and her beautiful family but she just she was just like this lifelong crusader who was not afraid to ruffle feathers i mean that bit about her standing on commonwealth avenue with a hand carved wooden penis i mean that's i don't that's not what you think of most junior leaguers doing you know no um so lauren ask do we have any more information about that um, suffrage meeting um expand how it was organized or or how many people came do you, i mean do you have more information to to delve into that yeah kevin do you remember how many i mean the 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 headline is it was like this 
its biggest snowfall of the season, and Blanche was afraid that it was going to be um, have to cancel it. But these women trudged through the snow. How many were there, Kevin? Oh, close to a hundred. Yeah, yeah, and it yeah. was. Um, I think it was a January, a January eleventh. Uh, and in fact, the people over at the Friends of Borderland, the people over at the park, um, um, and I think Catherine, you you were involved with that, putting together. Um, the play there, the Pat, Pat was in it. Yeah. The so, reannouncement. Yeah. 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 You guys will know. What I, what I do know about it was Modwood Park was really a big part of it. She was um, basically the big name of the day. Um, that that personality that uh, Blanche was able to get to attend. Uh, so she really was like the the keynote speaker, so to speak, and. Um, I, th I think that that uh, garnered a lot of interest, but people were not going to be uh, denied going to, you know, that, that was kind of the, the moment when the snow had stopped and, and even though the transportation had been at a halt and people were having a hard time taking the, the train out of Boston and such, uh, they still had that meeting and yeah, so that's kind of what I know about it. And if I'm correct, then there were, I think there were 32 women from Brockton that participated as well. Sure. Yeah. We, we have that list and we're actually going to, at some point, high it, uh, high, highlight it on the interpretive signs that we're going to have outside the Brockton Library in a couple of months. I do want to yeah. say near the end of uh, the production, near the end of the research, we did um, actually, uh, Bill Ames and I went over to uh, the Brockton Public Library, and we were up on the second floor in a back room with with uh, some microfilm, uh, some old microfilm, and we were able to go through uh, the uh, some some of the uh, older uh, Brockton newspapers and and find articles about uh, Borderland and Blanche Ames, uh, which was quite a discovery. We didn't expect that when we when we went over there. It was it was kind of a blind. A blind uh, stab at it, but it was really cool. One of the one of the articles we found it was there was a fire at Borderland that was threatening to uh, uh, to burn down the 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 house or or you know the area. And the fire departments of both Sharon and Easton had showed up, and uh, Blanche was out there uh, directing firemen around and uh, grabbing buckets and and so on. And uh, there was a good little. Good little read. Um, let's see, Betsy asked, where are some of the most accessible repositories of Blanche's papers most post-COVID? So I believe a lot of them you can get on, you can go on to their website, the school, the Harv um, Scholster Library, I believe. Um, and you can link in that way, or even through the Digital Commonwealth of Massachusetts, you can link into some of those repositories. Am I missing any other places, um, Kevin well, or Kate? To... Yeah, I, I mean, um, by far, hands down, the um, Sophia Smith collection at uh, Smith College uh, has just, you know, bins of um, uh, photographs and letters and newspapers. And uh, so that, that really is the, uh, that's the mother load of Blanche archives. Um, do we know if those are digitalized so people can reach them? Um, I don't think so. Um, I think they were thinking, of do, uh, or, I think they might be in the process of doing that, mm -hmm. but they are meticulously uh, organized and uh, well kept. But I don't, I do not think, uh, and I could be wrong, but I don't think that they're digitized. No, um, in fact, most people from the outside have to pay about a $35 a year fee to be have access to the Smith collections, um, mm -hmm. but I think in that in that case, I think that I mean a, maybe an amateur historian like me, who's not so amateur, um, can get access. You know, and um, I wanted to make a um, maybe this isn't the time, but I wanted to make a comment about class. I'm certainly a graduate of a very elite private women's college, and um, seeing the forwardness of women like Blanche. And what they were what they were able to accomplish in their concern for working class women and Catholic women and all of that is just so incredibly admirable. And um, I think so too. I think so too. 
Yeah. She she wrote a very moving um, feature story for I can't remember what newspaper it's for about if I were a poor woman, hmm. and she was very aware that she enjoyed privileges that made yeah. motherhood much yeah. easier for her than than for women who had eight kids and no cook and no nanny. She was mm-hmm. very, and I think you know Anne Billings Clark makes the really good point that more than anything else, Blanche had, I mean, she had monetary wealth, of course, but she had such a wealth of imagination. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It allowed her to be so empathetic. And it's, I think, without, without that imagination and without the empathy, yeah, she could have, she could have just yeah. said, well, it's not my problem. I always thought my woman's college Barnard was the more sensitive um, social work kind of um, out there, but since living around Smith and having a, a sister who's a Smithy, I, I've tried to cope, hope my prejudice in, in check. <laughs> it's just because there's all kinds of wonderful things that have gone on with those colleges and others, many others. I think her parents also get a lot of credit for instilling this sense of, of um, social justice in her. I think it was in her blood. Yeah, the, the story of, um, we, we don't really talk too much about it, but uh, Adelbert, Adelbert Ames' time as governor of Mississippi after the Civil War during Reconstruction um, was, uh, that was, it was one of those moments, one of many moments in American history that we don't hear a lot about, but I, I'm sure that um, uh, the, black population of Mississippi were being nothing less than terrorized on a daily basis. And um, he took a very strong stance uh, to try to protect uh, their rights. And um, um, because of that, they were, they were, they tried to impeach him. Um, And uh, so he he fought very hard for that. And I think they mentioned a little bit in in the, in the film, but that had to have an, an effect on her. I believe. And she was also, I think she was aware of at the same time, right around the time they built Borderland, they had these big factories up in, um, you know, as we know, you know, up in Lawrence and, and off the Blackstone River Valley um, and up in the Merrimack River Valley. So she, I think she was uh, certainly aware of uh, women and children uh, working in, in the factories. Um, some of those factories were owned by um, friends of her of her family. And uh, so that, that was probably, that probably also had a little bit of an effect on her too. I'm excited to hear about her father because some of my biographical research for what I'm doing right now has to do with a, um, a woman whose husband was prominent in Louisiana and what she did for the Louisiana State Fair that um, had feminists come from everywhere around. and. Um, so to know more about Reconstruction in her family is very exciting for me. So she, uh, again, uh, somebody asked the question earlier about what were some of the things that surprised us about Blanche during the process of making the film. Um, at the, when she was, the, the book that she wrote about her dad, uh, about Adelbert, uh, she wrote that book when she was 80 and she wrote it, I think she wrote it out of anger um, she felt he was, um, uh, his, his reputation was impugned by Kennedy in the book, um, Profiles of Courage. So this is what I heard. And then I read Profiles of Courage. It's basically one sentence in that book that, uh, slight, that does disparage Adelbert Ames. She sets about after that and writes, um, uh, three three letters to uh, President Kennedy, one when he was still a senator, uh, trying to get him to, to uh, take that out of the book, take that line out of Profiles of Courage. But anyway, she winds up writing a 680-page book about her dad, 680 pages. And I thought, you know, when I picked it up, I thought it was just going to be, you know, something that was basically full of reference materials but it's a very, very well-written book. And in, in uh, meticulously describes uh, some of the things that I'm talking about. 
his time uh, in, in Mississippi and, um, and his time as an officer and, and so on. But, but it's, a, it's a great book. And if you're looking for some other material that goes Kevin, to something that Blanche wrote. Kevin, you know what I'm going to say? I'm going to say, I wish she had spent those years writing her autobiography. Mm -hmm. But that's just me. Yeah. It's on the I know she was a very devoted daughter and she was outraged that Kennedy says this in profile, but it's like if if she had she was maybe she was too modest to realize that her life story. Sure. That she re we really I really wish she had taken pen to paper and written her own life story. But that would have been maybe that would have seemed yeah. too much. She didn't even get the headline in her own obituary. Right. <laughs> so maybe she just she would have considered that frivolous, I think. <laughs> yeah, maybe so. I think Pauline, her daughter Pauline, did write a, little, a, a book, a short book um, yeah. about her. Yeah. yeah. Their, their time at Borderland, yeah. What about questions from some of the others of you? Chris, you're pretty quiet tonight. <laughs> you're you're muted, you. Chris. Chris, you're muted. I'm a little tired tonight, so I'm not even, I wasn't even aware <laughs> I was <laughs> muted when I was talking. But um, uh, I did see the, the movie at the premiere at Stonehill, and it was wonderful to see that and uh, to be a part of that experience and worked with Catherine and, and the library staff and many other people on that reenactment, which unfortunately was delayed, but um, we did put it together with the help of, of Oliver Ames High School students, and that was exciting for everybody to be involved with that. Um, I don't really have a question. I, I thought it was a beautifully made movie. Um, I'm thrilled to see it get more exposure. Uh, it belongs on PBS sometime. I think it would be great if they picked it up and showed it. It'd be wonderful. Uh, and I hope that happens. I, I see a question in here about political cartoons. Um, and there are some on display at Borderland. Um, we have several on our Facebook page. Um, and Not as many as Blanche's, but I, those I can't, I can only found a couple of Blanche's, but oh, okay. I know Borderland does have them like a story walk um, at the park itself, which I've been waiting to get over there and see. Um, which, Kath, Catherine? Um, and you can also go on. Uh, for the land website, and they have the cartoons. The Borderland website has them. Great. Okay. Um, I guess I. I mean, I guess I have a question on. Um, so why you were doing your research on the, on Blanche and Borderland? Is there anything you had to leave out that just still resonates with you that you couldn't get into the film, or you put what you thought was the most relevant to everyone? Maybe that's two questions in one there. We didn't there. really have time to get into the, her inventions and all the patents she had, just because that was, you know, we were, we were conscious about time constraints, but also it was just a whole nother rabbit hole that we could have, but there, I mean, that's a fascinating side of her. And I think they talk a lot about that on the tours of Borderland, but you know, her biodegradable toilet and the, um, Kevin, what do you call the, the strings that she would hang down on planes uh, to, the, um, to knot up the propellers and right, right, right. Anti-aircraft. Yeah. 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 yeah, Blanche as the inventor, we really don't touch upon that at all. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I just, I think, I think uh, Kate and I both felt that the uh, the suffrage story and the, the, the rights issues mm -hmm. just seem to be a little bit more uh, relevant at this point, at this moment. It is, it's, it's interesting to know also her her mind just was so she was just so ingenious and i think she brought her inventive spirit to yeah. these mm -hmm. other battles to the political battle and reproductive rights she was yeah. inventive she was clever there was one thing that kate there was one thing we left out that um i um and we could put her back in but i don't think it was ever in but um there was a um a discussion that we had with one of her grandchildren and it actually came up at the uh, at the end of the premiere when we were doing a Q and A, and that was um, Blanche's um, beliefs about the right to die, mm -hmm. and um, we just felt I, I, I was I was really moved by one interview that we had when um, 
you know, Blanche would say, oh, I'm too old. Or you don't want to look at me and, you know, that kind of thing. But mm -hmm. when we extrapolated that conversation, it was, uh, it, uh, it turned out that Blanche was uh, a big believer in the, in, you know, the, you know, right to die, to be able, again, and that, that is, um, you know, th that's all part of her, uh, idea about um you know having control over your own body and uh and, and making your own decisions so it's something that we, was left out of the film but i i think uh it's it's kind of stuck with me a little bit and kevin uh, i think i put it in one of our early drafts but then it looked when you put it near the end of the of the film then it just begs the question wait did blanche off herself and then you have to explain that she yeah. believed in it, but we don't think she did it. But then I'm like, I don't know, maybe she did do it. So it just, I felt like I was in quicksand. So I'm yeah, just like, no, no, actually, yeah, you know. Yeah, I, yeah. You know, I it never just, thought about that. So. It made me nervous. Yeah. Good call. <laughs> but it Even is, though, kind of, it is kind of, uh, it says a lot about Blanche. You know, yeah, yeah. For that fervent belief in being able to control yourself, you know, your own life. And, uh, but yeah, Kate, I forgot why we didn't. <laughs> I what just, you... I just, every time, literally, I mean, some, as a writer, you do get into quicksand. You're like, yeah. I just have to step out of this quickly because there's no, it was just bringing us down. Yeah. yeah. So there's a few other um, comments in the chat box and questions. Um, Laura says, I would also send this documentary to Meryl Streep and perhaps inspire her to make a feature uh -huh. film about Blanche's life. So there you go, in addition to PBS. So you, you, you got your work cut out for you there. Um, <laughs> um, and then Grady's asking the question, are there any public records of Blanche's architectural design of Borderland? Have any books been written about it? Well, Kevin, are there? Have you seen drawings? About, about the ar architectural design? Yeah. Not, not that I'm aware of. I did get to see the actual Art, the, the actual design, they still have them. That's pretty cool. Actually, I mean, there's a shot of it in the film. Yeah, I think, so. yes. Yeah, yeah. But um, if, you gave, if you gave like a seven-year-old a crayon and said, draw like a castle, that is kind of what you would draw, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, there's nothing fancy about it. It's just sort of, it's sort of elegant in its simplicity, I think. Yeah, it actually does look like a house that she lived in. I think it is in Tewkesbury. Uh -huh. uh, but the house is now is so I did see some old pictures of how she lived in and it looks a little bit like that house uh, another question how did Borderland become a state park anybody know that I think, I think the children I think, I think the children decided right Kevin yeah, yeah the family uh, sold it to the state around uh, 1969 1970 I believe and um, and it was not a unanimous decision. I think there was a little bit of uh, a little bit of infighting. So, uh, but I'm not sure. But you know, we'll have to wait for the sequel. Yeah, that'd be lovely. <laughs> so I love I love Gail, Gail's comment here. Um, I'd love a fictionalized conversation between Blanche and Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Yeah. <laughs> did uh, Blanche did Blanche have any formal legal background? I'm not aware of her any formal legal background, but uh, I'm not even. Were her dad was her dad a lawyer? I don't think so. Uh, yeah. yeah. How about education? Did she ever get involved in education issues? I don't. I can't think of like public education. I can't. I'm not aware of Kevin. Or, are you? She would sponsor. I think. I think she chose her battles very. I think she was. She targeted her ballots pretty, yeah. pretty carefully. Yeah. I, I'm sure she considered suffrage part of education. I think she was educating men yeah. uh, why they need to vote for it. To me, to her, I think that was education. Yeah, and she was, you know, to a certain. I mean, Oakes. Remember, Oakes was a a, a professor at Harvard. Um, he was a botanist and a professor. Um, and I think he was even a uh, dean of of one of the schools over there later on in his life. So, um, you know, she illustrated his, some of his, um, his books, his journals, but you know, that she, I, she, I, I don't see her 
from what we've um, but what we have looked over as her being an educator or in education, aside from you know the, this one-on-one -on -one battle where she would uh, try to influence people, um, yeah. So um, Jen just put into the chat box the link to the survey that Mass Humanities would like you to fill out. So if you could go to that um, before you completely forget. Uh, that would be really great. And, I fucked uh, it in sooner because we lost a lot of people. Sorry. <laughs> saw that. Um, that would be good, yeah. And Mass Humanities helped us with the film as well. Yeah. So That's great. And they're, they're funding this whole project, which uh, it's now, I think, up to 50 different events between when we started the end of January and when we're going to finish in um, November. Um, so we still have some more to go. Um, I think most of you are on our mailing list. If not, please put your contact information in the chat box and we'll include you on future mailings because we have everything from uh, book discussion starting next week on John Lewis's book, March. Um, we've got the, oh, uh, Jen, you want to talk about what came in today? A big giant box, um, but big as me. Um, we have the American Bar Association has sent us their, um, their displays um, on, um, I have it here, the traveling exhibit 100 years after the 19th Amendment, their legacy in our future. So we're going to have that on display. There's six of them and we're going to divide them up. Three will be available at the Brockton Public Library in our auditorium, which you can come in and see. Um, and then the other three will be at City Hall down in, I believe, the Rotund. We're waiting to hear on confirmation on that, I believe. And then we'll switch them halfway through the month. We have them for the whole month of October. Pretty excited about that. Um, be setting them up probably Monday or Tuesday. So they're ready for the whole month of October. Um, and then we also have another display that's in there too in the auditorium at um, Brockton Public Library. Um, we also will have like after the book discussion, and then um, on we'll October on the twenty first, right? What is oh, it? Again? How about um, uh, we did it for you? Does anybody yeah. know about we did it for you? I was just no. about yeah. We did it for you is going to be on um, October eighth at six thirty. Um, the ladies from that will be doing their play for us. So there'll be a play about the suffrage movement and the women involved in it. Um, it will be done live, so this is going to be, you know, a, a wonderful opportunity for you to um, not only watch that, but also after the fact, you'll be able to talk um, with the actress, actors and actresses that were, that are a part of it, but um, they've been going around largely, I think, to uh, different libraries and other organizations in central and eastern Massachusetts. Um, and it's going to be not only about the suffrage movement, but also civil rights issues and whatever. It's, it's going to be a really phenomenal production, and I hope you can all participate in that. Um, Betsy says, this was fantastic. I'm inspired to look in the Sophia Smith collection as soon as it's open. And um, she continues, the interviews with the grandchildren were a wonderful entrance into her life and personality. And they certainly embody many of her perspectives in their continuity. Kate, thank you for reminding everybody to vote, vote, <laughs> vote. As if anyone could forget this year. <laughs> You'd be surprised. <laughs> and the reason I say that is because uh, through my affiliation with the uh, Brockton NAACP, we've been trying to get people to fill out the census. And um, as of today, we still have less than 60% of the residents of Brockton filling up the census forms. And I don't wow. get it on any level. I don't get it. Yeah. So do we have any final questions, thoughts for or from Kate or Kevin? We, I am still on cloud nine that we both get you both here with us tonight. Um, it's fabulous, fabulous, fabulous. Ladies okay. or gentlemen that are left, anything? Feel free to unmute yourself and have a conversation. Please do. Is Ms. V, you usually chime in with something. Come on, where are you? <laughs> <laughs> I, can I say something real Hi. quick? We, we are, um, we just, we're, we're wrapping up a, uh, we've um, 
uh, made a uh, curriculum guide. Uh, oh. So we, we've uh, com just about completed this curriculum okay. guide. So we, uh, we do plan on being uh, to try to go to schools uh, with the, the idea of a screening and uh, a guide with it that will hopefully generate some uh, discussion. Some oh, awesome. Yeah. Great. I'll uh, pass that info along to uh, the head of the social studies department at um, Brockton High School. Yeah. Ms. V, did you Go ahead. Well, I did have one question. Uh, uh, during your research, was there anything that sort of stuck out or rang a bell that was uh, like what's what we're going through right now and um, whatever her journey was and the things that, that she thought were Im important? Was there anything that like just popped out at you and you said, oh my goodness, this this is now or this is you know yeah all, all the time like from <laughs> beginning the middle the end oh no um, <laughs> okay. in fact that was one of the reasons why we got going on this in the first place it's a conversation i had uh with both my daughters after the last election mm. and uh, it was kind of a little bit of wind in the sails um so yeah of course you know and the, one of the things too is like the way blanche went about things and I do say this, I'll, I'll, you know, is that sometimes it isn't about getting really angry or emotional, but just figuring out a way to get it done. And I think yeah. Blanche was really good at that. Okay. I agree. I'm just thinking too, I mean, it's so easy to get depressed and think, I cannot believe we are here. But just in reading all these tributes to Ruth Bader Ginsburg these last few days, and the, you know, the laws that she helped change that, you know, women, we don't need a husband or a brother or a son to sign, you know, to borrow money from the bank. I mean, I just think we are making progress and then two steps forward, one step back, two step forwards. I, I just, <clears throat> during these days, I just try to channel my inner Blanche because you know, that's what she was going through for all those years. Fighting it. It's just, it's just never done. It's just, you just can never take it for granted. Um, I'd just like to say something. This is Stacy. Um, I've been enjoying all this, but kind of tired. And I was kind of just sitting back and listening, being kind of passive. But one thought that kept running through my mind was, you know, one of the grandchildren, I think, was that George Plimpton, who I believe was a, a well-known literary gentleman. Is, am I right about that? Yes, George at Plimpton? a parish review. Mm -hmm. Well, I just remember hearing his name from a very young age. And this is an example yeah. of how I just think that, you know, our media and different institutions in our country, it's changing, like with the New York Times and like the 1619 Project, but, and, and her obituary, for example, the wife of somebody, but how the man or the male, and this, I'm speaking mostly of white males, got the attention for their achievements, where the woman was in the background, the mother, the sister, the wife, um, and and think of all, I just, I think of all, like of all history, just how few women got recognized. And, and it's like they're the hidden gems, you know, like you're uncovering and, you know, not, not to take away anything from George Plimpton or anybody else or her, her, the, her father, the general, but it's like, just, I'm just reminded of all that. The women who were just like, you know, most people don't know who they are. I could, I could not agree with you more. I mean, when even I, going into this project, I'm like, okay, I know Susan B. Anthony, Elizabeth Cady Stanton. Um, you know, we can all name the character of Friends, but like, if you have to name six suffragists, it's like, yeah, and <laughs> that's a good project. <laughs> I would have been hard pressed <laughs> <laughs> press to name six suffragists. Um, no, really. but, but we really, even as women, we have to do better. And we have to remember that all of these movements have more than one or two leaders. Right. You know, just mm -hmm. because history books are lazy and they only give us a couple names, we have to remember this. It's, it's a ground, it's a groundswell. Right. So thanks for doing it because it just okay. uncovers people from the go past. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, one of the, yeah. go ahead. I was going to remind us all about the work that um, we've seen come up about African American suffragists in the mm -hmm. research that Willie Wilson has done and the panels that we've seen in the past 
through the programs here at Brockton Public Library, the names of women that um, were left in the dust of history uh, in, and uh, who were remarkable women who, who uh, were, because of racism and um, expediency, were not allowed to have a, a place and a voice in the, in the mainstream suffrage movement. Uh, and right. um, like Mary Church Terrell and um, uh, Josephine St. Pierre Ruffin and um, others, and Ida B. Wells, of course, but those were names that we did, ha didn't have any idea about. There's another topic for, for another um, documentary for you, um, <laughs> if you're in looking for a, an idea. <laughs> if, you're, if you're ever bored, sometimes Google statues, women versus men. That's why I was, yeah, happy to, yeah. I was so happy to hear that Ruth Bader Ginsburg was going to get a statue in Brooklyn. Because, really? No, is she? Yeah, because there are so is, many yeah. statues to generals and, and this, and then every once in a while you get yeah. a statue to like motherhood. Like you can't even think of a woman. <laughs> That's it, right. That's it. Like deal. <laughs> Just so mad. Remember the controversy of the little girl on Wall Street? Oh, that was, yeah. you know, standing there. I mean, they weren't, they didn't let that go until they got rid of that statue. She had to be moved, you know. Mm -hmm. It was just um, too much. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. yeah. Well, speak, speaking of unknown women, um, one of the things, again, I'm, I'll refer back to the interpretive signs that are going to be going outside the front of the library, hopefully by November at some point <laughs> it's been a, a a real challenge but um, the three signs are going to have a different focus um, the first sign is going to focus on women in Brockton or you know Blanche is going to be part of that nearby um, they're going to be 18 by 24 foot signs and they're going to be like interpretive signs like you would see on a park or a, you know a okay book walk or something like that so the first sign is going to just focus on women in Brockton and, you know, one interesting piece of information. And thank you, Kevin, for mentioning the, um, arc, the um, uh, microfilm over at the library, because one of the things we found out is that Brockton had the first um, Massachusetts suffrage organizations. Um, and I think, uh, let's see if I can do this. Uh, 1869. It was really early. Um, it, absolutely amazing information. So that'll be on that. The second um, interpretive sign is going to be on black suffragists in Massachusetts. And Willie has found over 300, I think, of them. Mm -hmm. um, so we'll have that information. That'll be on the second one. And the third one, if anyone wants to chime in right now, um, is going to be um, women who became uh, politicians as a result of the fact that the 19th Amendment came into place. Hmm. So if you would like to recommend some women for us to uh, focus on, we want to try to make it as diverse as possible, feel free to throw that in the chat box and um, we're hoping to make some decisions by next week. Or if you think of it later, send, uh, send an email to our, right. email uh, to our regular account. So, all right, we're coming up on, wow, we'll have to eight here, Pat. Woo. All right, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for joining any, us. Any, any thank final you. comments yes. or questions? Yes. Or, yes. Thank you, yeah. um, I'm going to put thank the uh, so survey back in the chat box so that anybody who hasn't gotten it yet would really like you to fill it out. But thank you so much, okay. Kevin, Kate. You know, you guys were wonderful. And the film is phenomenal, and I agree. Yes. Send it to PBS. <laughs> um, I can't wait for it's on DVD so I can buy it. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> cool. Okay. Good, right, night. Thank you all. Good, Good night. Good night. Stay safe. Thank you.